Hey guys, welcome back to today's video. Today is Monday, September 16th, 2024, and today we are going to be talking about the battleground state of Pennsylvania and how the Kamala Harris and Donald Trump campaigns are focusing very heavily on this state as it will likely determine the future president of the United States. Kamala Harris and Donald Trump's campaigns across a number of battleground states have really been trying to meet head-to-head -head when it comes down to the spending and the allocation of resources in these states. For instance, if Kamala Harris's campaign is throwing $20 million into Michigan, the Donald Trump campaign is responding by throwing 10, 15, potentially even $20 million. Now, the only state where the Trump campaign, who has had a huge cash on hand deficit, uh, that has been able to match the Kamala Harris campaign is in the state of Pennsylvania, where they are nearly uh, just separated by just under $1 million in terms of advertising spending, resource allocation, all of these different things that are important to run a presidential campaign. All of these things now being invested into Pennsylvania and specific on both ends by equal amounts. And so that really brings us back to this point. Why is Pennsylvania so important? What does Pennsylvania actually mean in determining the outcome of the presidential election? For context, back in 2020, it voted with the winner of the election in that it voted for Joe Biden by a margin of 1.2%. Back in 2016, it also voted for the winner of the election in voting for Trump by roughly a point. And then in 2012, voted with the winner in 2008, did so as well. And now that it has become far more competitive in the era of Donald Trump and current Democratic politics, Pennsylvania is a state that both parties see as a must win given its huge electoral presence, and not to mention the fact that it is an indicator of how many other battleground states will go. And the big reason for that, too, is because Pennsylvania is uh, really part of what we call the Blue Wall, the Blue Wall that stood for 24 years until it didn't in 2016, dating all the way back to the 1992 presidential election when Bill Clinton won Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania all together. And from then onward, they had voted together in every election, including 2020, and hasn't really broken since. In 1996, went to the Democrats. In 2000, went to the Democrats. In 2004, went to the Democrats, despite some really close calls. Wisconsin being under a point. In 2004, Wisconsin being under a point again. 2008, very solid for the Democrats. 2012, solid blue wall. And then it came all crumbling down after years of Democrats winning, 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 until they didn't when Donald Trump won it. But what did he do? He didn't just win Pennsylvania. He won Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. And a lot of people reflect on this day and age and say, how is it that Hillary Clinton lost these states? Did she just not focus on the Rust Belt? And on one end, sure, right? She didn't visit Wisconsin after the Democratic primary and after the Democratic convention. It was pretty much sort of wraps at that point. And she said, you know, what? we're going to win in Wisconsin. And at the time, the polls showed her up seven, eight, nine, ten points. It really didn't make sense from a logistical standpoint to focus time on Wisconsin without this hindsight that we are all given, right? There weren't any alarm bells really being raised except for a few local state reps, local state senators who knew the area well, who could speak to the fact that it was more competitive than otherwise. But at the time, it seemed to be drowned out by the noise, by the fact that uh, Hillary Clinton was leading in a number of other states. But when it comes down to Michigan and Pennsylvania, the Hillary Clinton campaign didn't leave these states to chance. In Michigan and Pennsylvania, they held multiple rallies here. In fact, the Democratic convention was held in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Democrats made a concerted effort for this battleground state because they knew how important it would be. And so while Hillary Clinton certainly lacked in the, in the hindsight to be able to campaign in some of these states like Wisconsin, she didn't necessarily have that same thing attributed to her as in Michigan and Pennsylvania, even if the narrative has largely been that Hillary Clinton did not touch the Rust Belt. And the reason I'm spending a lot of time talking about this is because I do believe in 2024, just as it did in 2020, they will vote all together. Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania will likely not differentiate from each other when it comes down to who wins them on the electoral scale, which is exactly why Democrats see Pennsylvania and Republicans see this state as a must win. Because for them, it's not only an indicator of just 19 electoral votes, but the 15 electoral votes from Michigan and the 10 electoral votes from Wisconsin that could total up to the magic number needed of 270 electoral votes with everything else counted that Democrats or Republicans need in this race. Now, Nate Silver made uh, a very good article, or not even an article, I guess, wrote it here on the Silver Bulletin talking about conditional probability. And essentially what it means that if, you know, Kamala Harris wins one state, what does that mean for the rest of the model? What does that mean for the rest of his forecast? Now, today he has Donald Trump defeating Kamala Harris in his forecast. His head-to-head -head national has Donald Trump roughly at a 59, 60% chance of victory. And so with Donald Trump being in the advantage, this is something that has been pretty consistent throughout the uh, Nate Silver uh, model forecast here. At periods of time, he did have Kamala Harris ahead, but largely speaking, we're working under similar constraints. And so what he talks about here is essentially how important is every single state to uh, determining who wins the election, right? So if Kamala Harris is able to win some of these states, especially the ones that are more competitive states, right? Obviously, it says if Kamala Harris is winning in the state of Iowa, she has a 98% chance of winning the election. If she's winning in a state like Alaska, an 80% chance of winning. 
But what's interesting to me is that those states are far out of reality and far out of likelihood of going uh, to Kamala Harris, or potentially even on the flip side, Donald Trump getting a 96% chance if he went to New Jersey. That makes sense, but that doesn't mean that Democrats, Republicans rather, should invest in New Jersey. Again, it speaks to a larger movement and an impact that a candidate can have in a region and on certain numbers of battleground states. But Pennsylvania really comes in as this one that I do think is really strong for Kamala Harris and Donald Trump should they win this state. It's a 96% chance at winning the election for Donald Trump if he wins Pennsylvania. In other terms, as Nate Silver puts it, a 4% chance for Kamala Harris to win the election if Trump wins Pennsylvania. On the flip side, if Kamala Harris wins Pennsylvania, a 92% chance at winning. Donald Trump would have just an 8% chance at winning the election without Pennsylvania. And that's why this matters, right? Pennsylvania is this state that Democrats know also has a 34% chance of tipping the election. Essentially, that state that puts one candidate or the other over the top to 270 or beyond 270, allowing them the Electoral College victory and every other state beyond and before doesn't really matter. Pennsylvania is that state that's receiving a lot of funding, a lot of resources, a lot of conversation, and a lot of press and media coverage and rally coverage, all these different things that Kamala Harris's campaign, Donald Trump's campaign know this state is the one to win. And when it comes down to electoral math, this also makes a lot of sense as well, right? When you're understanding what it means to be a tipping point state, I mean it when I say it, it could be the reason that Democrats get over the finish line. And allow me to explain. What I'm going to do here is characterize all of the states that Biden won by five points or more in the last election. States like Virginia and New Hampshire and Minnesota and Colorado and New Mexico and Nebraska's second district. And beyond that point too, where does this bring us to uh, roughly uh, two, 226 electoral votes? Now, when it comes down to Pennsylvania, as I was saying, it votes in this block of the blue wall, meaning Wisconsin and Michigan would more than likely follow suit, just as they have for the past 24 years. And it is this more unique, broad appeal that appeals to the white working class voters in Erie, Pennsylvania, as they do in the outskirts of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, right? The outskirts of Ann Arbor, Michigan, and a college town, all of these different uh, areas the Democrats want to invest in and have been investing in this is where you really start to see a strategy really taking full force, because it is this region that Democrats have tried to tailor messaging to on the national scale, but also on the local scale. They've tried to tailor surrogates to, tried to tailor all of their different things, whether it's advertisements or, uh, you know, unique ways that you go about rallies and where they hold the rallies and who they speak to and who they have speak. All of these different things are part of this political calculus. Why? Because it is a region of the country that really does matter uh, to the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, which is why they know both sides, they need to invest heavily in the states. So Pennsylvania, if that goes, Michigan and Wisconsin following suit would be enough to 270 electoral votes for Kamala Harris to be the next president of the United States. And it's sort of like a flip side right now uh, for Donald Trump. You know, you take all the states that he won back in 2020, and you know, that isn't enough Pennsylvania to put him over the top. I will say that, right? Even if he's winning all those states, uh, you know, Donald Trump lost a number of states that he won back in 2020, so uh, 2016 rather, so let's go to New Maine 2nd District, Georgia went to the Democrats. This is what the electoral map roughly looked like. But again, Pennsylvania is that indicator state. Even if Pennsylvania was to break away from Wisconsin and Michigan, chances are that if they, it did so, states like Georgia and Arizona would follow suit because they were decided by a smaller margin than Pennsylvania. So even in some weird circumstance where they don't vote altogether and Wisconsin and Michigan still go to Kamala Harris, should Donald Trump win Pennsylvania? He's more than likely winning in Georgia as well as Arizona. And even without Arizona, he's winning the election at, guess what, 270 electoral votes. And so I'm really at an interesting point for me in understanding this election through the lens of Pennsylvania, because it is a state that I think once we hear it called an election night, we practically know who has won this election. American politics is weird, but in many ways it is predictable. And so what we found to know, uh, come to know this race, just preemptively before election night, is that Pennsylvania is that state that does make a difference. Pennsylvania is that state that does determine the outcome of the presidency. And all of the times that we've spent talking about other states, in theory, may not matter the moment that Pennsylvania is called. Now, what I find, I'm, I'm going to stop saying the word fine because I think uh, I'm using it a little too much. But what I have, you know, come to understand also, too, about investments from presidential campaigns when it comes down to states like Pennsylvania, when it comes down to states like Michigan, when it comes down to states like Wisconsin, these things really don't let up, right? When we saw the Biden campaign, when it was the Biden-Harris campaign back in April, announced the $250 million ad reservations across the seven battleground states after Labor Day, Pennsylvania was number one there. And it has been relentless ever since. Because this state is so important, we know that both campaigns, no matter how much money they have, because Kamala Harris's campaign has $300 million right now, cash on hand that they can spend 
they're going to invest probably a third of it into the state of Pennsylvania. And again, it's because this state has mattered so much, not only back in recent presidential elections, but it has been a heavy indicator as to how some other elections might be going or might have gone, meaning that they could really determine whether we call this a blue wave, red wave, or just a flat year for both political parties. And 2022 is a perfect example. When we were talking about Democrats doing well in 2022, the expectation here was that maybe they would be able to hold on to some of these swing Senate seats. But in no circumstance did anybody ever expect Democrats to gain seats in the United States Senate in what was largely heralded as this red wave year. The House was meant to be a massive flip for the GOP, and the Senate seemed to be a cakewalk for them given that they were up in a number of these states, up in Nevada on election night in the polls, up in Arizona on election night in the polls, up in Georgia on election night in the polls, up in Pennsylvania on election night, according to the polls. At minimum, they were supposed to get 53 seats in the Senate. Republicans started investing in states like Washington and Colorado and New Hampshire because they thought, because this is a red wave year, we're going to win there. But take a look at those margins. New Hampshire went to Democrats by 10. Colorado by 15, Washington by 14. And so all these investments really didn't matter, but there was one state in particular that we looked at to really drive this indication as to what type of year this was. And it was the state of Pennsylvania, which voted for the Democratic Party by five points in the Senate race here against Dr. Oz, John Fetterman, the Lieutenant Governor, who's facing multiple health complications. Many voters did not have high confidence that John Fetterman could serve out the full term, but rather than elect an elected Republican, they simply wanted the Democrat to win here rather than the Republican for a variety of different reasons. On one end, it was that Dr. Oz embodied all of Donald Trump without Donald Trump's enthusiasm. He was the Make America Great Again candidate, which turned away a lot of voters. Only Donald Trump really does inspire his base to turn out in elections that matter. He couldn't do that in this cycle. Not to mention the fact that John Fetterman was a relatively popular and well-known figure across the state. Even with health complications, voters liked him. They voted for him in the primary, they were excited to vote for him in the general, and he was able to translate that into an electoral college victory. And the final point here, when you're taking a look at the race, Dr. Oz was out of state. Right? And a lot of the expectation here was that because it was a red wave year, there's no way Pennsylvania, a state that Biden won by just 1.2% would go to the Democratic Party. And so when they spent money elsewhere, when I'm talking about national Republicans and super PACs that were controlled by Mitch McConnell and many other top ranking Republicans, investments in states like Washington, Colorado and New Hampshire, where they spent millions of dollars, likely could have been spent elsewhere. States like Nevada, where they lost the race by less than a point. States like Georgia, where they lost the race by less than three points. It's always something to take into consideration post-election, but Pennsylvania has been this indicator state, and it did tell us a lot about the 2022 midterms. When it was called for John Fetterman that evening, we knew that the House was going to be in contention. We knew the Senate was no longer going to go to the Republican Party because it was the only flip of the election cycle, and Democrats won it. And so overall here, what I think Pennsylvania has come to teach us is that we should be watching it very closely. And so one thing that we haven't talked about much in this video is the status of polling data in this state. And I will say, it is also just as close as we've been talking for quite some time now about what it means to be, you know, such a battleground important state. Pennsylvania is very, very close. Kamala Harris has an advantage here of 0.6% across the state. That's not something that seems to be super strong, right? This is not a massive, massive victory uh, for Kamala Harris. But it isn't for Donald Trump either, right? Both candidates have proven to be in really, really close positions, not only on 538, but also on Real Clear Politics, where Kamala Harris holds a lead of just 0.1%. It's really interesting to see, too, how much this race has narrowed since the entrance of Kamala Harris in the presidential race. Donald Trump led Joe Biden by 4.5% across the state of Pennsylvania. Kamala Harris again today leads across 538s and Real Clear Politics' forecasts. Now, of course, this is one end of things. It doesn't mean everything. A 0.1% advantage is not something anybody should ever take for granted or ever should count on to win an election. But it is good news, at least, at bare minimum. The Democrats are not lagging behind like they were under President Biden, who was down 4.5% in what was a must-win state for both sides of the aisle. Now, polling data, again, we've talked about there. I'm also interested to see Nate Silver's forecast has uh, Pennsylvania going to Donald Trump 538's forecast, has Kamala Harris winning the state of Pennsylvania. But I wanted to go ahead and take a look at a forecast uh, interactive model from back in 2020, exploring the ways Trump or Biden could win the election. Now, you might be wondering, why am I talking about 2020? Well, Pennsylvania, as I've been saying, is that state that really rings true to be the most important state in this cycle uh, because of how close it has been and also how important it has been in years past. And this map here allows us to give certain candidates victories in some of these states to really map 
the chances at victory on the national scale. And they give us a wide range of states. The 2020 election had far more swing states than the 2024 election does. So it ranges all the way from Arizona down to Wisconsin, across over 10 states that are considered to be battlegrounds. But let's go ahead and just, you know, humor us for a moment in characterizing Pennsylvania at face value for Joe Biden. Now, if Donald Trump lost Pennsylvania at base, at, at, you know, just that alone, Joe Biden wins Pennsylvania. If that one's locked in, Biden wins the election, a 99% chance of winning and an average of 363 electoral votes. Now that's assuming that Pennsylvania is the only state that has been characterized. This thing would start to be toned down by the fact that Trump would win Ohio. Okay, then he gets to a 2%. Then he wins Texas. Then it's 3%, right? Donald Trump wins North Carolina, like he did, 5%. Donald Trump wins, uh, let's see, another state that he won, Florida, right? gets better for him. And so, of course, we have to go through this whole thing here where we're sort of giving Donald Trump all the states that he won in the election. But here's what really happened, right? For the remainder of these states, Joe Biden won them. Colorado went to Biden. Arizona went to Biden. Georgia went to Biden. And so at this point, he's already reached 270 electoral votes. But you take it away, you start to know that Joe Biden is winning this race. Joe Biden is in a really strong position. And a lot of it really is driven by Pennsylvania, which pretty much keeps Donald Trump, despite winning some of these other states, under 10%, which is exactly what we saw on election day when Joe Biden did win Pennsylvania. And Donald Trump was still able to run up the numbers in Ohio, win in Texas, run up the numbers in Florida, and win in North Carolina. Even then, there wasn't a pathway forward because Pennsylvania was blocking. And what happens to states like Michigan and states like Wisconsin with this scenario where Donald Trump's winning all of those other states and Joe Biden Biden's winning Pennsylvania, Wisconsin and Michigan are 94 and 96 percent respectively going to Biden. And even if we were to give Trump states like Georgia, right, give him states across the map, like, uh, let's say, not New Hampshire, but maybe another state that's more competitive states like Nevada, right? It gets to be a 23, 30 percent chance of winning for Trump. Pretty strong, but still Joe Biden in the advantage. But here's what's holding out on him. Wisconsin, 85% chance for Biden. Michigan, 89% chance for Biden. It really doesn't show that Donald Trump is in a position where he's going to lock down many of these other states just simply based on the fact that he's able to win Texas, Arizona, North Carolina, Georgia, Florida, and Ohio, which very well could be our scenario in this election. And so all in all, what I'm taking away from Pennsylvania is just how important it really is and how the electoral math here works for Republicans and Democrats, depending on who wins this state. That probably drives a lot of the conversation around whether or not Kamala Harris should have chosen Josh Shapiro, whether or not Kamala Harris should have held the convention in Pennsylvania the same way Democrats did back in 2016. It's all these different levels of consideration and all these different conversations that will likely be had before and after the election. But one thing reigns true. Pennsylvania is the most important state in the 2024 election and will likely continue to be one of the most important states on the national electoral map for decades to come. Pennsylvania is a very competitive state. And the data right now shows that it really is anybody's game. But on election night, depending on who wins it, chances are we'll know the president far earlier than the networks will based on one call in specific out of this battleground state that will likely determine the future of American democracy. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down suggestions below. Subscribe on the left if you haven't already and check out the Instagram and Twitter. At the top left of the screen, there's also a Discord server for you to go ahead and join. On the screen, there's a video you can watch and then a playlist for my 2024 presidential election analysis videos. Again, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you all later today.